Good evening and welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Max Nelson. I'm happy that you've uh, joined us today and taken a little bit of time out of your busy schedules to learn about uh, union alternatives for public school teachers. Uh, again, my name is Max Nelson. I'm the Director of Labor Policy here at the Freedom Foundation. Happy to be hosting the, uh, the webinar today. Uh, my uh, position here at the Foundation is as Director of Labor Policy. I've been here for about nine years now. I uh, also spent a little bit of time working at the uh, Federal Labor Relations Authority, and I am passionate about helping workers learn about and exercise their First Amendment rights. Uh, the Freedom Foundation, again, my employer, the host of the webinar tonight, shares that mission. Uh, you know, we're a 31-year-old nonprofit, nonpartisan organization uh, founded and uh, headquartered out in the Pacific Northwest uh, in Olympia, Washington. Uh, but we have a growing number of regional offices around the country and are increasingly working uh, on, on the national scale. Uh, now, our mission throughout our history has been, uh, has been the same. It's been consistent uh, and guided by our, our mission statement to promote individual liberty, free enterprise, and limited accountable government. Uh, now, as part of that mission, we firmly and proudly believe that all workers should have the freedom to make the decisions about union membership and representation that makes sense for them. Uh, and the purpose of today's webinar is to help uh, public school teachers in Connecticut uh, better understand some of the rights and options that you have that you may not know you have or may, uh, may want to learn a little bit more about. So hopefully, uh, as a result of the presentation today, you'll, you'll come away feeling uh, better equipped uh, and more informed uh, when it comes to uh, sorting through the, the choices that you have. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get too far along. Uh, if you have any questions or comments during the webinar, uh, please feel free to submit them via the chat function at any time. Our staff will be working uh, to answer as many of those questions as possible. Uh, now, to en ensure confidentiality, know that your questions are going to be visible only to our staff, not every participant uh, in the webinar. Um, and we'll be doing our best to get back to you as, you know, as quickly as we can uh, throughout the course of, uh, of the presentation. Now, if you have a question that we don't have time to address to, uh, or that you want uh, more follow-up for, uh, please include your email address and or your phone number along with your comment, and we'll do our best to, uh, to circle back to you within the next couple of days. We'll, we'll be going over those comments here after the webinar is, is done and following up with folks who have requested that. Uh, now, without further ado, uh, let's move on to the substance of the presentation today. Now, as, as I'm sure many of you or most of you are certainly familiar, uh, prior to 2018, many state laws, including the law in Connecticut, uh, required uh, public employees to pay union dues or fees as a condition of employment. Uh, and that historically has, has been the case in the public sector for, for several decades. Uh, however, in June 2018, in the Janus versus AFSCME, that's AFSCME, American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, uh, yeah, in that decision, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that forcing government workers, including teachers, to financially support a private organization violates their First Amendment right to free speech. Uh, essentially, uh, the court recognized, as we have long argued at the Freedom Foundation, that compelling public employees to give a part of their paycheck to a private membership organization, which could then turn around and spend that money on whatever it saw fit, uh, even if it violated the conscience uh, uh, and beliefs of, of the uh, membership, that that was uh, not permissible, not, not acceptable uh, under the First Amendment. It, it forced people to subsidize political speech through their union dues that they might find uh, morally repugnant or even just disagree with. Uh, now, it's important to also note that the court didn't just strike down compelled dues payment. The court went a step further and clarified that unions and public employers can only collect union dues in the first place from a public employee's paycheck if the employee affirmatively authorizes the deductions. And that's a huge distinction uh, and, and important for, for many different reasons. But the, the takeaway is if you have not signed up for union membership and you have not knowingly and affirmatively uh, waived <laughs> your First Amendment right not to join, uh, then the union and your employer don't have any business deducting union dues from your paychecks to begin with. Now, with that initial background, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how teachers unions are structured. You know, just because you have this right doesn't 
mean that you automatically know what to do with it or, or how uh, to go about exercising it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what it means to be a member of the NEA or the AFT. Uh, and I think it's important to keep in mind how these organizations are structured. Uh, the first observation that I'd make is that we, we tend to think of unions as uh, fundamentally different from or opposed to businesses or corporations. And it's, it's really not an accurate way of thinking about how unions work. Unions are essentially businesses just like any other entity. I mean, they exist to collect dues and generate revenue uh, in exchange for the service of providing workplace representation to their membership. Uh, fundamentally, that's a commercial transaction at the end of the day, just like, just like any other. Uh, and so unions tend to behave just like you would expect uh, corporations or businesses to, to behave. They try to maximize uh, the amount of revenue that they bring in, minimize the amount of work they have to do, try to squash competition wherever uh, the opportunity arises to do so. Uh, and, and otherwise, they, they tend to behave just like any other business would. Just an important note, I think, when you're thinking about how to interact with these organizations. Uh, now, there are two main unions that represent teachers. Uh, there's the National Education Association and the American Federation of Teachers, uh, both of which are active in Connecticut and represent teachers and public school employees. Uh, the NEA affiliate uh, in Connecticut is the Connecticut Education Association. Uh, and the, the AFT affiliate just goes by AFT Connecticut, uh, but both are structured very similarly. Uh, at the bottom, you have uh, the local union, and there's typically one per school district. Uh, locals can vary quite a bit in size and structure depending on how large the district is, how many members it has. Large locals might have their own full-time staff and a physical office, whereas smaller locals might be run uh, entirely by volunteers. Um, but either way, the locals tend to handle most day-to-day -day union functions, contract negotiations and grievance representation and, and things of the like. That's what most people understand uh, and, and, and associate with because uh, that, that's what they, they interface with uh, when they're dealing with the union. Uh, now, above the local level, uh, there can be a regional affiliate, sometimes called a UNISERV, and, and those are typically operated by paid union staff. Uh, and above the local and above the regional, you typically have a statewide affiliate, uh, which often has a physical office and a number of full-time staff. Uh, the Connecticut Education Association and AFT Connecticut uh, both have their statewide headquarters in the Hartford area. And then above those, above the local, above any regional, above a statewide, uh, you have the national union headquarters. And both the uh, headquarters for NEA and AFT nationally are, are down in, uh, in DC, the nation's capital. Uh, why is that important? Well, each one of these layers is technically its own entity. It's its own organization with its own budget and its own legal obligations. Uh, but when you become a member of a union that is affiliated with the NEA or the AFT, you are paying dues not just to that local union that's representing you in the workplace. Your, a portion of your union dues are being forwarded up the hierarchy to each one of these levels. So when you when you are considering uh, whether it makes sense to be a member, you have to consider not just does it make sense for me to be a member of my local union, because you're also getting membership in each one of these higher level entities as well. Now the rule of thumb is the lower the level, the more work gets done on actual workplace representation. Your your local union in your district is like I said before, it's going to be doing the bulk of union work, uh, but a great deal, perhaps even a majority of the dues that you pay uh, are not going to the local. They're going to the statewide, they're going to the national headquarters and, and so on. So it's important to know what these higher levels of the union do with uh, with your dues money. Uh, both unions at, at national, nationally, the NEA and AFT have to provide certain financial information uh, to the U.S. Department of Labor every year. Uh, and so I just wanna highlight a few data points from those reports, give you a sense of uh, what these organizations look like at the national level. If you want to look them up on your own, you certainly can uh, by navigating to unionreports.gov.gov. Uh, these, these are all publicly available. Uh, according to its financial report for 2021, the National Education Association had total revenue of about $588 million. Uh, of that, about $100 million went to staff salary and benefits. Uh, just as a couple examples, the NEA's current president, Becky Pringle, 
was paid about $431,000 last year. The executive director, Kim, Kimberly Anderson, was paid about a little under $407,000. Vice President Princess Moss uh, was paid almost $372,000 and so on. One other um, item, though, that I thought was interesting, caught, caught my attention, uh, was that the former executive director of the NEA, John Stocks, who stepped down as executive director in 2019, so you know, three years ago, uh, he's still on the payroll of the National Union as a quote-unquote special advisor, uh, and he was paid $334,000 last year. So I'm not entirely sure what he's special advising about, but I uh, thought it was interesting that he's still on the payroll. Uh, again, of the uh, National Union headquarters NEA uh, budget last year, $66 million uh, was spent on political activities and lobbying and nearly $118 million was spent on contributions, gifts, and grants, uh, generally to advocacy organizations, ideological groups, and, and so forth. Uh, the, a, the American Federation of Teachers, AFT, structured very similarly, but it's the smaller of the two unions nationally. Uh, last year, according to its most recent report, uh, its total revenue was about $259 million. Uh, just under 47 million of that went towards staff salaries and benefits. Uh, the longtime president uh, of the EFT, Randy Weingarten, uh, was paid uh, nearly $450,000 last year. Secretary Treasurer Frederick Ingram was paid uh, about 312, almost 313,000 dollars last year. Uh, 48.8 million was spent by the EFT on political activities and lobbying, and just under six million. Uh, was spent on contributions, gifts, and grants. Now, it's important, I, I mentioned politics, uh, political spending a couple times here. Uh, I think there's an important clarification that needs to be made before we go any further. Uh, and you may have heard, some, some unions like to claim anyway, that they don't use members' dues to make political contributions. Uh, and often uh, they'll make some passing reference to you know, federal law. They'll, they'll say federal law doesn't allow us to use members' dues for politics. And that's partially true. Uh, I mean, federal law does prevent unions from spending dues money uh, to make contributions to candidates for federal office, president, Senate, Congress, and so forth. Uh, but federal law does not say anything at all and does not prevent unions from using dues money to engage in local, uh, state and local elections for governor, or state legislature, or school board, uh, and unions often do use dues money to engage in those elections. So uh, while the local union may or may not uh, be that engaged in political activity, if you are a member of an organization of, of a union that's affiliated with the NEA or the AFT, at least some of the dues that you pay are definitely set aside in at least one political fund. Uh, again, without taking all night on this, I, I want to give you an example for the NEA and an example for the AFT. So the, the National Education Association has uh, actually several political funds. The one that is most visible that people are probably most familiar with is the Fund for Children in Public Education. And that particular political fund, uh, NEA goes out around the country and, and solicits uh, contributions to and, and asks its members to contribute above and beyond the dues that they pay and make voluntary contributions into this political fund. Uh, no objection to that. Uh, you know, everybody is free to contribute you know, to whatever political fund they like. Uh, but that voluntarily funded uh, political committee received uh, $6.4 million in the 2019 to 2020 election cycle. That's, that's a lot of money. Uh, the, what is less known, however, is that the NEA also has another political fund called the Advocacy Fund, and that is funded by dues. Uh, that is something the National Education Association, again, receives its cut of the dues that members pay and some of that money the NEA sets aside in the advocacy fund to go towards gubernatorial races, state legislative races, school board races, and so on around the country. And that fund uh, received $25.2 million in the 2019 through 2020 election year, dwarfed the amount of money that NEA members contributed voluntarily. A similar story with the AFT. Uh, the AFT maintains a Committee on Political Education, or COPE, uh, that is funded by voluntary contributions from members, and it raised $14.8 in the 2019 through 20 
election cycle. Uh, but the AFT also maintains the Solidarity Fund, which, as you might imagine by now, is funded by union dues. And that received uh, $25 million uh, was set aside by the national AFT in dues money during the 2019 through 2020 uh, election cycle. So it is absolutely true at some level, at some capacity, uh, your dues as a member of the NEA or the AFT are definitely going toward political activity. Uh, now, uh, I also want to touch base briefly on, on how to go about resigning your union membership. Uh, the Freedom Foundation has put together a, a comprehensive resource uh, website, optouttoday.com. That's O-P-T-O-U-T today.com, where you can uh, select your state, select your union, and complete and print a uh, dues cancellation form that you'll just sign, mail to the union at the address provided, Usually certified mail is a good way to go, so you have proof that it was delivered, uh, and that uh, that gets the process started. Uh, we also have an option to print uh, a copy of the membership form. I don't have access to a printer. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, print a copy of the dues cancellation form if you don't have access to a printer, and we can mail that to you if, if you like. Uh, now, state laws and union practices vary. You'll hear a little bit more about the Connecticut-specific situation for teachers here in a minute, but uh, if you do run into any difficulties getting your dues deductions canceled, uh, please free, feel free to reach out to the Freedom Foundation uh, for assistance, and you can do that through optouttoday.com as well. So what happens? You go through this process, you send the form in. What happens if you resign your membership in, in the union and, and stop paying union dues? Uh, well, the rule of thumb is that generally you will keep uh, anything that is provided by your employer in terms of wages, benefits, conditions of employment, uh, anything that's that's covered by the collective bargaining agreement will continue to apply to your employment. Uh, now, what changes is not so much your relationship with the employer, but the relationship with the union. And you lose the ability to participate in internal union affairs like voting in union elections or access to any members only benefits that the union may have arranged uh, for members in good standing. Discounted theme park tickets would be one example. Uh, now, one question that often comes up from teachers is, you know, the uh, union provided professional liability insurance. Uh, and the, the short answer to that is that only a small fraction of the dues that you pay go towards covering the union's cost of, of a liability insurance policy. Uh, and there are non-union alternatives available at a much, much lower cost. Uh, and we will also hear at length about that uh, a little bit later in the program. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to pass the baton off to Michael Costanza of Constitution State Educators and Frank Ritchie of the Yankee Institute for Public Policy, two fantastic gentlemen uh, who have uh, lots of experience and insight into uh, Connecticut specific issues involving teachers unions and union membership. And they are going to uh, get a little further into the weeds with some fantastic information. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll pass it on to Michael and Frank. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Costanza, and I'm a lifelong Connecticut resident and a Connecticut teacher for 16 years now. And I'm also the founder of a group that sprung up grassroots through social media this past year called Constitution State Educators. And I want to first say thank you to the Freedom Foundation for agreeing to host our webinar tonight with us. And also thank you to the AAE and Christian Educators Association for joining us tonight to talk about the benefits that they offer to teachers who choose to opt out of union membership. I also wanna welcome Frank Ritchie, who's on the screen with me right now. He's the fellow of labor at the Yankee Institute here in Connecticut, former Connecticut firefighter and a former union president of the New Haven Firefighters. So Frank, thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me, it's an honor to be here. Tonight, our goal as Connecticut residents and a Connecticut teacher and a former Connecticut firefighter is basically to dispel some of the misconceptions and offer some reassurances to teachers and for that matter other public employees who are considering whether to remain as members of their unions or not. And I've been a teacher now for 16 years. I've not been a union member and nonetheless I've survived just fine in the Connecticut school system and bit by bit I'm meeting more and more teachers across Connecticut who are making the same choice. With Constitution State Educators, we wanted to create a group this year as teachers' discontentment with the unions grew, a group that could serve as a safe landing place for teachers. Uh, 
teachers have various different reasons for why they may wish to belong to a union and why they may wish not to. But we want to underscore that it's their First Amendment right to choose not to join a union if they so wish, and that there are other options available to them out there. Unfortunately, there's a lot of misconceptions in, uh, out there, and sometimes the unions, either out of hostility or perhaps just out of innocent ignorance, get the facts wrong. And that's where Frank uh, can do a, a wonderful job of correcting some of those misconceptions. Nobody in Connecticut understands labor law that better than he does and what your rights are as a member of a public union or as someone who's chosen not to join. So Frank, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your experience with the New Haven firefighters, your background, and some of what you, share some of your wisdom about what union obligations are to Connecticut school teachers, whether they join the union or not. Mike, thanks, and I'll be glad to. Uh, my union background is, I was in the union chairs for 16 years, I did two terms as vice president and I retired after in my second term as president. I delivered one of the most lucrative, probably the most lucrative contract for my members in the state. So I am definitely not anti-union. One other thing that New Haven did that I think, and I'm really proud of this fact, is we put not only in our contract, but our membership cards, that if an individual wanted to exercise their first amendment rights, all they'd have to do is send an email to the union or an email to the city. And within 30 days, that's a pretty reasonable number. Within 30 days, their dues would stop. What we see unions doing now is they play games. They say you can only opt out if it's a full moon on Tuesday and there's a dog barking. It's, it's really sad. And as a union president, I viewed it as it's a way to hold me accountable to my members. Um, I'm not anti-union. I think that unions can succeed when they just advocate for wages, hours, and working conditions. Mo most people say workers should have a voice, and I agree with that. The problem that I see is that unions got involved in everything else besides work, and that goes against people's values. And here, it's their First Amendment right. They can exercise that right either way. Now, on the responsibilities of the union. There was kind of a balance with the Janus decision at the Supreme Court. And the balance was if the union was going to maintain sole exclusive bargaining agent, in other words, they are the sole organization to negotiate your contract, then the union had to represent equally the same members and non-members. So when you opt out of a union, if you make that choice, the collective bargaining agreement, seniority, everything that you see in that collective bargaining agreement pertains to you 100%. That includes grievance rights. Now, there is a misconception out there, even for union members. Individuals believe that the grievance belongs to the individual. That's not true under state labor law. The grievance always belongs to the union. So it's always the union's ability to say, we're going to take this grievance to you know, the labor director, and we're not going to take it to arbitration. They have that authority to do whether you're a member or not a member. The grievance under state law belongs to the union, not the individual, but everything in that collective bargaining agreement pertains to you. Yes, they can say, we're not going to invite you to the Christmas party or the Hanukkah party. That is true. But anything that has to do with the employee and employer relationship, they it's 100% enforceable. Now, Mike, as a teacher, how did you come to that really important decision to opt out of union membership? Well, I came to teaching as a second career. I was in journalism beforehand, and I, I grew up in a household of educators. My mother just recently retired, in fact, as a school social worker. My father taught high school Spanish for over 30 years, both here in Connecticut, and I'd always had teaching in the back of my head. Um, but I think coming from that background in journalism and from other careers, you know, I'd had the chance to work in settings without unions and with unions. I, you know, obviously I followed news coverage a great deal about union issues as a, as a reporter in my previous career. And it was always in the back of my mind, what would I do when I become a teacher? Would, will I join the union or not? Now, I, I live in a, I teach in a small town in North Stonington, Connecticut. It's where I grew up. And when I knew I was going to be joining the staff there, the faculty of the school system there, I had the privilege and the opportunity to work with some of my former teachers. 
And most of them were union members, just like my parents were. They were all proud members of the Education Association. Um, but there were some who were not. Uh, one, te one of my former teachers, in fact, who I worked with briefly before he retired, was not a union member. And I talked to him a little bit about it as I was beginning to decide whether to join or not. And he gave me some guidance. I really appreciated his guidance. And I ultimately decided, you know, for my own various reasons that I didn't want to join the union, not because I didn't like what the local union did. Most of the members and officers I knew well, I appreciated their bargaining for our contracts, but I had serious qualms about the political activity of both the Connecticut Education Association and the National Education Association. I, I did not, I, I was not comfortable with the sheer volume of political spending that the state and national unions do with members dues money. Uh, to me, it, it was an example of union freeloading that they're using your money or my money as members to push their own political agenda. And I don't think that's fair. As you said a moment ago, I think unions serve their members best when they stick to the basic issues that unions were created for, namely the, the contract under which you serve. So I opted not to join the union and that, that was, that's been fine for my career. I have a collegial relationship with my colleagues, whether they're union members or not. We've always respected one another's choices in this regard. And in fact, uh, at one point, several years ago, the union even asked me to join them in helping to negotiate the language in our contract for our sick bay. But I've noticed that the, the tenor has changed since the Janus decision in 2018. I think at that point, the unions became worried that they were going to lose so many members once members were aware of their right to opt out and without paying agency fees. And so I, for the first 12 years of my career before the Janus decision, I paid an agency fee as required by law to the union, which as you know, is the lion's share of dues. I think it amounted to 85% or so of regular dues. I no longer have had to pay that agency since the Janus decision, but also since the Janus decision, not so much from the local, but again, from the state and national unions, there's, there's a different tone there. I see deliberate attempts from the unions at the state and national level to use scare tactics, to obstruct teachers who wish to leave. Uh, in some cases, just out and out misinformation. At times I've been willing to give them the benefit of the doubt and think it's, they're, they're just becoming familiar with what Janus means like the rest of us are. But in many cases, I think it's been deliberate. And in the last two years in particular in Connecticut and perhaps much of the nation, that has gotten worse. I think with uh, some of the mandates that have come down on teachers like me quite hard regarding COVID, some of the, uh, the debacle of remote learning during the COVID shutdowns and some of the very extreme uh, political demonization and the pushing of political agendas in the classroom that have really come to the fore in the last two years. The unions have abandoned teachers, I think, at the national and state level. Not only have they walked away and abandoned teachers, but I, in, in, in most cases here in Connecticut, the unions have become cheerleaders for those unfair mandates and for some of the demonization that's going on politically. And I've seen wonderful teachers, teachers of the year, and other you know, friends of mine around the state who actually lost their jobs in the last two years and the unions said nothing, or in some cases, in at least one or two cases I know have scoffed at those teachers. So that's a, get what pushed me to create Constitution State Educators. I want it to be a clearinghouse for information on our Facebook page. I want it to be a place where teachers can come and feel like it's a landing place where they can meet other teachers who have opted out or are considering it. And they can find information there like templates for letters that they can send to their unions to withdraw. Mike, you brought up yeah. this great point and where, and let's just take the vaccine mandate and it doesn't matter where you fall on it. I just right. had COVID and I was vaccinated and boosted. But here's the thing, unions had a responsibility to represent their members. And as a union president, I've had to represent members who beat their wives, um, had domestic disputes with their husbands, uh, drunk driving, all things that I would never agree with or, and, but I had a fiduciary responsibility to represent them. That's why people pay dues. So to have the unions take dues and then say, well, you know what, we're just going to make a, a value choice and we're not going to value all your years of education was really disheartening because that's not the union's job. 
Yeah, and you know, as teachers, we we know around the state, my colleagues and I, we can't afford to be tearing each other down. Um, we we need we would appreciate collegiality and the fellowship of a union to protect us when we're being treated unfairly, perhaps by an administrator, or maybe in some cases being treated unfairly by parents or whatever it may be. And we, we deserve better than unions tearing us down for the personal choices we make. So it pains me to see in, in some cases, a lot of cases, the state union, but also in some cases, some of the locals around the state uh, telling, shaming teachers or misleading teachers when they're simply asking questions about their First Amendment rights and union membership. We should be able to respect one, one another for different choices that we make, just like I had the good fortune of working with colleagues who respected me for the choice I made when it came to union membership, and in turn, I respected them. So, you know, this, this year, I think we're going to see more and more teachers around Connecticut become aware of their rights to leave the union, and August is a big month between now, May, and this August. It's a critical time for teachers to become aware of their rights to leave the union and how to do so, and also to become aware of, the, of those essential facts, I call them the five facts, that they should know just in case their unions, either on purpose or accidentally, are getting those facts wrong. And, uh, and, and again, you, you know, you've had experience with sending in letters to the unions. You know how some of them have these rather arbitrary rules that make it awfully difficult to drop out. So in, in, in the case of the Connecticut Education Association, that's the August opt-out window. August is that time in which teachers can drop out. Now the Freedom Foundation with their links to their webinar tonight and groups like the AAE and the Christian Educators Association all have on their websites ways to generate your own letters to opt out. We've posted them as well on the Constitution State Educators Facebook page. Um, but Connecticut teachers specifically need to know if they're in the CEA, and most of our state's teachers are in the CEA, that letter has to be postmarked and sent to the CEA office in August. And um, uh, we'll, we'll share that information with the attendees in our webinar tonight, but their address is, uh, the CEA's address is Capitol Place, Suite 500, 21 Oak Street, Hartford, Connecticut, 06106. And it has to be marked to the attention of Cheryl Hampson, or their current membership director. And, and uh, the AFT, which the, most of the remaining teachers in Connecticut belong to, letters to them to opt out need to be sent to their office at AFT Connecticut, 35 Marshall Road in Rocky Hill, 06067. Um, now, this, the AFT does not have an August rule. They leave it up to their locals to make rules. Hartford's AFT and New Haven's AFT, for example, might have different rules about their opt-out windows. So the sooner teachers send in these opt-out letters, the better, because if there is some opt-out window they must comply with, they'll find that information sooner. And anyone who has any questions, you know, can feel free to contact me as someone here on the ground in Connecticut to get them the information they need to make sure that that opt-out letter is respected. And I know you want to speak to that too as well about, about opt-out letters and what you found useful and how we write them. Absolutely. This definitely isn't the firefighter situation where you can just send an email and get out. So we recommend that you send a certified letter with certified mail, follow it up with an email as well. I mean, union membership for a teacher in Connecticut is like a bad gym membership. They try to make sure that you can't get out. It's kind of, kind of like the Hotel California. You can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave. So right. they, they build these roadblocks to actually impede you from following your first amendment rights and it's kind of sad so definitely make sure that you send it certified mail um, get a copy of it i know some people are comfortable with dropping and had people in connecticut come up and say you know i want to go to the office and hand them the letter i don't have an issue with that as long as they get a copy of the letter that they submitted time stamped on the date that it's received that way if the union does play any games with your constitutional rights um, we can hold them accountable Absolutely. And, I, and if you want to hand deliver it, fine. I, I do think it's wise perhaps to do that, but also send it certified mail as well. And I've also been telling teachers just to cover your bases, when you send your letter to the CEA during the month of August, certified mail, why not also send it to your local? And why not also send it to the, uh, the HR department of the school district in which you work? Just so everyone's on, a, on the same page 
and is aware that you're exercising your First Amendment right to leave the union. And Mike, uh, another thing that's vital is regardless of what letter or what mechanism you use to notify them that you're opting out, make sure you ask for a copy of your membership card. Because under Connecticut state law, while I don't believe it's legal and individuals are free to, to challenge it, but as of right now under Connecticut state law, the opt-out window goes by what's actually written on the individual's membership card. So make sure, regardless of letter, that you're asking for the membership card. Wise advice, yeah. And th those five facts, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I want to share those with the many people in attendance tonight. Uh, sometimes I call these the five facts the unions don't want you to know. But again, that depends on, your, some locals are great about this. Others simply are just unaware or the state union hasn't brought them up to speed. But they're real simple, five facts. Number one, as a Connecticut teacher or as any public employee, you do have a right to leave the union if you wish. Your employment is not contingent at all on being a union member, you can leave. Number two, once you've opted out of the union, you do not have to pay any fees whatsoever. The agency fees that non-members like myself used to have to pay before the Janus decision are gone. You can still send your union a, a check at Christmas time if you'd like, but once you have left, you do not owe a dime. And you can save that for most Connecticut teachers, it's around $850 a year in union dues. You can save that for yourself. Uh, number three, one, uh, you mentioned this earlier. Once you've left the union, your contract still applies to you 100%. Uh, the teacher's pension, the medical benefits prescribed in your contract, all of the workplace protections in your district's contract still 100% apply to you. And like you said, even the grievance procedure, it still applies to you. Uh, the fourth fact is that the union, even if you're a non-member, still has a legal and ethical responsibility to represent you and serve you. They, they still have to negotiate you, for you because they have a monopoly on bargaining rights. And by law, they must represent you fairly in all contractual matters, including the grievance process. The, the fifth fact though, and this is important, and this is why it's so good to be hearing from the AAE and the Christian Educators Association tonight, is that you have a right to join other professional associations. Since the Janus decision, I've been a member of the AAE, the Association of American Educators. They are not a union, I'll repeat that, they are not a union, but as a professional association, they provide many of the same uh, protections and representation that a union would provide to you at work if you wish to use it. Now, my membership in the AAE is $198 a year. It's $16 or so each month. And as an AAE member, I have a liability insurance policy that is actually more generous than the union's insurance policy. It's in my name, so I don't have to worry about accessing it. Sometimes the union or district policies are in the union or district names. So teachers sometimes can be rooked out of using a liability insurance policy. Uh, as an AE member, I also have le access to legal guidance and protection. If I ever face a disciplinary work at, uh, issue at work, if I'm called in for a meeting, I'm, I can bring, or I can ask the AE to help me, to represent me at that meeting or to, to find someone who can represent me at that meeting. The union is still obligated to do so, but the, as an AE member, I have that added level of protection. And that's good to know that fifth fact that we can join these other associations because if your union officers are ignorant of their responsibilities since the Janus decision, or if they have simply chosen to be hostile to you because you're not a dues paying member anymore, it's nice to know, it's, it's a peace of mind to know that I have the AAE there to help me. And I have found them to be incredibly responsive. If I ever send an email to them with a question at work, I hear back from them at the most 24 hours later. Uh, and if I need to call them, I can talk to them immediately. And the Christian Educators Association provides identical coverages. The, their mission is a bit different because of, of um, the ministry that they provide to their members apart from, apart from teaching. But both groups, I've, met, I've gotten to know some of the people at both groups, and they're outstanding people. And it's nice to know that they're here to, to serve us if, if the unions are stubborn in recognizing their duty to do so. So thank you for letting me cover those facts. And Frank, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Appreciate your time. 
No problem. It's an honor to be with you. And again, you know, it's up to individuals to make a choice for themselves, whether they want to be a member or not be a member. There's one other thing that I just want to cover uh, quickly, and that is if you wanted to decertify your union and replace it with another union. Connecticut law is very specific. If you wanted the Department of Labor to come in and hold a vote, you just can't go nowhere. Um, you have to have a union. And the way Connecticut law works is the union that you go to has to be in existence for six months. So there's a lot of great independent unions out there. And if anybody wants uh, more information on that, they could definitely reach out to me at the Yankee Institute and I'll do everything I can to help them. But the law is very simple. You need 30% of the members of that local to sign cards to say they want to bring um, the union who is the sole representative up for a vote. And it's actually common practice in Connecticut. Every couple months, you'll see a union have a uh, certification and a decertification um, campaign or fight. It's most common with the police departments. You see Nutmeg Independent and the uh, Fraternal Order of Police Officers, and they switch back and forth. But there are independent locals out there that don't get involved in politics, that only focus on issues that affect you at work. and. Um, you know, and I'm in Connecticut, so and right. always available to answer questions. You can get a hold of me through Yankee or through through Mike. And Mike, I just you know, thanks for putting together this program with the Freedom Foundation and you know the, these great organizations, so that people can be informed of their rights. Because we, as Americans, we should all be informed so we can make good decisions. Make the choices best for ourselves. Exactly. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mike and Frank, uh, for the enlightening information. Uh, Mike and Frank are both two two great gentlemen, and uh, would be happy to work with anybody uh, out in Connecticut that wants more information uh, or uh, provide a little bit more information about the lay of the land out there. Uh, but that's uh, that's just part of the great lineup that we have for you today. Uh, we're going to transition now to uh, Shanna Morgison, uh, who is the membership director for the Association of American Educators and Noelani Kahapea, who's the Director of Policy and Strategic Partnerships at the Association of American Educators. AAE, unlike uh, the uh, National Education Association or the AFT, uh, is a professional organization for teachers uh, that offers a, a variety of benefits, including professional liability insurance uh, at a cost far lower uh, than you can secure through uh, NEA or AFT, uh, but it does not engage in collective bargaining and and formal union work. Uh, anyway, the uh, AAE is not officially endorsed by or affiliated with the Freedom Foundation, uh, but we, uh, we wanted to make sure that you have all the information necessary that you need uh, to help make uh, uh, informed choices about union membership going forward. So the, the information that they have to present uh, hopefully will be useful to you. And uh, with that, I will pass it over to Shannon. Thank you guys so very much for that introduction and thank you again to the Freedom Foundation for hosting this and we love being a part of this uh, group that loves shedding light on options for educators. So thank you guys at the Freedom Foundation so very much. And what I would like to do is introduce you to AAE. My name is Shanna Morgison and I am the membership team director for AAE, the Association of American Educators. And we have been around for over 26 years supporting educators nationwide as a non-union choice in a professional association. So I would like to give you an overview of AAE. We call it the five P's, but I'm gonna have one that's a little off. I'm gonna have a D in there. So it's gonna be the four P's and D, but we give this to our members so that they can share with colleagues and not forget anything essential about AAE. It kind of keeps us on track. So without further ado, uh, number one P for AAE is our protection. So 99.9% .9 of teachers join a professional association for the protection, which is understandable. With the cell phone, when you're working with children, anything can happen. 
the unforeseen with this lovely P, the pandemic happened. So every educator who works with children, which of course any anyone who works with children, really needs that professional support and having that protection. So ours is a $2 million policy, which is double any of any other association. And it's a policy written in your name, which is unique. So if you have any additional questions about that, I would love to answer that. And you can also find it on our website at aaeteachers.org. And number two is our professionalism. We know educators are professionals. They were the true essential workers this past year. We like to offer professional support so that not only are we helping our, our professionals, our members, but we're also showing the public at large that this is a profession that needs to be respected and show that our members truly for the, to show in the light that these are professionals who spend so much time in preparation for their students and truly care. <clears throat> so bringing the professionalism truly to the forefront of education is what we pride ourselves in doing. Number three is our philosophy. We believe that educators need support to best serve students. And other associations we feel <clears throat> truly focus a little bit more on the adults, what's best for the adults. Whereas we try to really serve our members so that they can in turn serve their students in the classroom. And uh, the fourth P is politics. We are a 501c6 trade association, meaning we cannot legally take your dues and endorse any political candidate or PAC. We turn it around and give it back to the teachers in the classroom in the form of our scholarship and grant program, which is amazing. And you can find out more about it on our website as well. You don't have to be a member to apply, but it, we give, I think, more money away than any other association in the country. So check that out. Number five is supposed to be a P, but I'm going to change it to a D, which is dues. Our dues are the most affordable of any association you're going to find. And again, I encourage you to look that up. You will see the dues on our website at aateachers.org. And you'll also see all of our other benefits. We have a wonderful advocacy program that some of you may be involved in or would like to be involved in. Um, they do so much in, in bringing awareness to different policies that affect educators. And we have, again, a professional development program. That's great. Uh, many professional programs available to you. A discount program that we affiliated with a few years ago that is wonderful called Abinity. It's very similar to Groupon, but you can save you tons of money. And we also have tons of supplementaries you can add. We have dental. We have a, a wonderful cancer policy. Uh, tons of things that you may want to add on. So check out our website. Um, without further ado, I am going to introduce you to our Director of Strategic Partnerships, Noelani, and she's gonna tell you a little bit more about who we associate with and affiliate with as an association. So thank you again so much. And if you're interested in joining AAE, we would love to have you. So without further ado, Noelani. Great, thanks so much, Shanna. Um, so again, my name is Norlani Kahapea, and I'm the Director of Policy and Strategic Partnerships for AAE. So I handle all of our federal policy. Um, and unlike other teachers associations, um, as Shanna mentioned, we will, we will never tell you how to vote or what your opinion should be about a political figure or issue. Um, my mom, she was a teacher for 30 years, and every year she would get a letter in the mail from the Teachers Association telling her who she should vote for. And that's something you will never get from AAE. Um, though we do still provide information for our teachers. So for example, in January, we hosted a federal education um, policy webinar on the American Rescue Plan stimulus bill and how it would affect teachers in classrooms, um, as well as an update on the Department of Education's policies uh, related to standards and assessment and COVID procedures. Um, so we will still advocate for our members on issues directly to education. So for example, uh, we are advocating for an increase in the educator expense deduction. We know that teachers have always gone above and beyond to provide for their students and their classrooms. Um, and under current law, teachers are able to take up to a $250 deduction on their federal income taxes for money spent on their classroom. However, most teachers, or I should say the average teacher, spends closer to $500 on their classroom every year. 
Um, and those in high poverty areas um, spend even more with principals spending close to $1,000 on their students. Um, and so we are advocating to increase the $250 cap up to $1,000 and to add home internet as a qualifying expense so that you can de deduct um, home internet expenses as well um, since a lot of classrooms are still using virtual education as part of their curriculum. Um, now, to, in order to illustrate the need of why this would be so important to teachers like yourself, uh, we asked our members to share their stories about how much they spend each year and what they spend it on. And we were overwhelmed by the response. Um, not only are teachers spending money on classroom supplies, um, like notebooks, pens, paper, um, and stuff for specific projects, but in higher poverty areas and even in the um, not the high poverty areas, they're still spending money on basic necessities for their students like toothpaste, toothbrushes, deodorant, and food. Um, and so AAE decided that we wanted to help give back and we are giving um, 10 teachers up to $600 um, gift cards to spend on classroom supplies on their upcoming school year. So this is one way that we are advocating for our members on um, education policy. Uh, AAE also has a lot of professional development opportunities for our members. So for example, earlier this year, we hosted a financial literacy course so teachers could better understand their pensions and retirement options. Um, and since uh, pension programs vary by state, we started with Colorado and we plan to bring it to other states. Uh, we also have professional development um, courses on other things like how to teach civics in an election year um, so that teachers can know what their rights are and what their students' rights are. Um, and then also on media training. Um, and speaking of which, we have a whole advocacy department uh, because we believe that it is vitally important that policymakers hear directly from our teachers on um, any education policy. Um, so if you're interested, we have PD courses on how to write an op-ed or how you can contact your congressman. And for those who want to get even more involved, we even have a fellows program. Um, AAE also has a discount program on groceries, entertainment and retail stores, and on supplementary insurance on disability insurance or life insurance. And all of this information is on our website. Um, uh, finally, we also have a grant program where teachers can win up to $500 in scholarships or grants for classroom expenses or even professional development. So if there's a, co a conference you wanted to go to, um, you can apply for a scholarship for it. And we do that every spring and fall. Um, so I know that's a lot of information, but all of our benefits are listed on our website. So if you like inf more, if you would like more information, uh, we encourage you to visit it. It's aaeteachers.org. And if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat. Um, or you can email us. Um, our emails are just our first name at aaeteachers.org. So mine is Noelani, N-O-E-L-A-N-I at aaeteachers.org. Or Shanna, my colleague, S-H-A-N-N-A at aaeteachers.org. Um, and if you like what you've heard and you'd like to join now, you can also visit aaeteachers.org backslash join. And you can join now. Again, our dues are only $16.50 a month, and you can start your $2 million liability insurance and job production today. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Max. Well, thanks, Noelani. Thank you, Shannon, uh, for uh, the update about uh, what's available through Association of American Educators. Uh, in a similar vein, we're going to switch gears and hear from uh, a somewhat similar organization. Uh, we're going to hear from David Schmooze, who's the executive director of the Christian Educators Association International, another professional organization that represents uh, public school teachers around the country. Uh, but as the name implies, uh, it's uh, specifically a, a religious uh, Christian organization, uh, unlike the, the Association of American Educators. And uh, so David is going to give us uh, an update about his organization and a summary of what they offer. Uh, to public school teachers seeking alternatives to membership in the NEA and the AFT. So off to David. Hello, and thank you so much to Mike, Rusty, and the rest of the Freedom Foundation team, and a warm hello to our friends at AAE. But most importantly, thank you, Connecticut Public School Educators, for your heroic devotion to your students and for your commitment to bringing up this next generation of citizens, of moms and dads, of leaders, in what feels like in these times an increasingly fragile republic. 
Hi, my name is David Schmoos, and not only was I a 15-year public school educator like you, but I am the Executive Director of Christian Educators, and I am honored to be with you today. You have endured as educators through a difficult season, have done the best you could to teach your students despite the obstacles, and have persevered. Many have left the profession, yet here you are, being a blessing and encouragement to your students and their families. I think some congratulations are in order for that, so congratulations, you've endured COVID, at least hopefully it's over. You know, we are in extraordinary times in the teaching profession. Never has there been greater need for teachers of true wisdom to guide students. But at the same time, never have our leaders been seemingly so determined to undermine public education. Through their policies regarding COVID, gender, sex ed, race and diversity, and many other issues, our union leaders in particular seem intent on driving parents away from public schools and costing teachers jobs, the very jobs they are supposed to protect. Of course, I get the sense that they are trying to drive us out too. Teachers who rely more on tested wisdom to guide our life and teaching rather than kowtowing to the latest ideological fads that are constantly changing. I'm so excited to be part of this event where you learn the truth about what unions are really doing and how they don't represent most of their members. You've also learned that there are alternatives to being a union member, such as membership in AAE or Christian Educators Association International. Of course, both AAE and CAI are part of the Trust for Insuring Educators, meaning that our liability insurance and job protection benefits are identical. And you may have discovered that AAE's membership dues are about $40 per year less than ours. So if you're just looking for the most affordable option for liability insurance, I would encourage you, join AAE. They are a great group and they will serve you well. However, I would like to take a few minutes to explain what makes Christian educators different and why I believe the Lord may lead many of you to join us. First, as I'm sure you figured out by our name, we serve Christians working in our public schools. So you do need to be a Christian to join, but we serve all kinds of Christians. So don't worry about what church or denomination, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, for example, uh, we will we'll be happy to serve you as members. But why do we limit our membership to Christians? Because we believe God has a unique purpose for followers of Jesus in our public schools, and it is our mission to encourage and equip them. But the truth is, so many feel alone, isolated, discouraged, and afraid. So many of us self-censor our beliefs, keeping our heads down and keep collecting our paychecks until retirement, but that's not how it's supposed to be. I believe God has called us to carry astonishing joy as we walk into a public school, to carry enduring hope and compassionate love. We believe God wants to use us in our public schools. So let me share with you briefly just five of the ways we do that, five things that that extra $40 per year helps to fund and make possible. First, when you have an issue in your school, we are here to guide you from a biblical worldview. We have both educational and legal experts, former superintendents and attorneys, for example, who will not only give you wise and godly advice, but will pray for you and encourage you spiritually. For example, maybe you had to, for example, restrain a student from hurting others and left a bruise or mark on him and now his parents are upset. Or maybe you received a bad evaluation or have a conflict with an administrator or colleague or maybe you are wondering if you have to teach a certain curriculum that doesn't align with your values or beliefs. Whatever the issue, whether it, has, whether it has anything to do with your faith or not, you have unlimited access to our consultants who will guide you every step of the way. Second, we host the Rise Up Summit, which is our yearly online conference for Christian educators. It is completely free for all who want to attend. Last year, we had almost 12,000 educators join us as we hosted leaders like Francis Chan, Alistair Begg, Greg Kokel, and many others to encourage educators. Check it out at riseupchristianeducators.com and join us in October. Third, we publish an award-winning magazine called Teachers of Vision to help inspire and equip you. Check out the latest issue at magazine.ceai.org. There is a just published article there called, Can You Trust Your Union? <laughs> How relevant. Uh, which I think would be worth your read, given your attendance here. Our paid members get a print version of TOV. Fourth, we put on local events under two ministry initiatives called Lift America and Awake that are designed to get Christian educators out of fear and isolation, connect them to God, to each other, and to resources that help them navigate being a Christian in our public school. I was recently in Portland for one of our Awake events, and an educator told me, that he felt the Holy Spirit lead him to drive to a certain place where he could receive a certain radio station on his car. And as soon as he got there, an announcement for our awake day came up, and he came a few days later. He cried through the whole day because he was so impacted. 
You know, we are seeing the lives of teachers changed all over the country, going from isolation to connection, going from fear to faith. And there is so much more that we do that I don't have time to explain. But let me share one more thing that your extra $40 a year helps to support. Number five, we offer a significant amount of free resources on our website. For example, our Teach with Faith webinar walks you through all the legal do's and don'ts for Christian public school teachers. For example, can I pray with students if I'm asked? Can I have a Bible on my desk or a religious quote on my wall? Can I host a, can I host a religious club in my classroom? All of these questions are answered in this free webinar which can be found at ceai.org slash faithwebinar. Take a look at our resource center on our website for much more. Finally, if you don't get all your questions answered tonight, just call us. We have real people staffing the phones all the way from 8.30 in the morning to 7.30 at night Eastern Time. We'd be happy to talk to you. So thank you so much for all you do for our precious students. And whether you join AE or CEI, we support your stand for freedom for educators and know that we are praying for you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, thank you, David. We appreciate the, uh, the fantastic information about uh, Christian Educators Association International and, uh, and of course, AAE as well as, uh, as two professional associations out there that are uh, available to teachers seeking alternatives to NEA and NAFT. I want to bring us a little bit toward the close of the evening here tonight by talking not so much about uh, what you can do as an individual, uh, and resigning your membership, you know, uh, as, as an individual choice. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, collective or group alternatives to representation from the NEA or the AFT or whatever affiliate of those uh, you're currently represented by. Uh, it is possible to uh, go, forego union representation entirely or to uh, seek different representation and to uh, change unions. That's a process that is governed by uh, individual state labor boards. Uh, there is one in Connecticut. Generally, the process involves getting uh, at least 30% of the teachers in the district uh, to sign petition cards calling for a vote to either decertify the existing union or change to a different union. Uh, there's usually a particular window period of time where these petitions can be filed. Uh, and it's a process that uh, you know, I don't want to make it sound too unmanageable. Or it really is, uh, you know, anybody can do it as long as you follow the rules, uh, know the rules and follow the rules. But it is helpful to, to have, uh, you know, an attorney or, or someone who's uh, familiar with the process to help navigate uh, the, the legal requirements. Uh, but it is uh, eminently doable uh, to, to get that uh, election called for, petition for. Uh, just as an example, you know, this, this model is, is not unprecedented. Uh, you, know, you maybe not have heard about it just because there really isn't any massive institutional interest in going out and promoting it. Uh, but it does happen a, a fair bit of, around the country. Uh, in California, for example, there's a, a decent sized school district, the Clovis School District, about 2,100 teachers there. Uh, and since collective bargaining was authorized for teachers uh, in the state of California back in 1976, I think it was, uh, the Clovis School District has completely forgone uh, union representation. Uh, and they have a faculty senate model that allows them to interface with the school district instead. And, and they believe that, that has worked well enough for them. They don't need formal union representation. Uh, other uh, school districts around the country have decided that they do want some kind of uh, union representation, but they don't want to uh, pay a large percentage of their dues to state or national organizations that aren't providing them a service in their district. Uh, and so they've decided to either disaffiliate from uh, the NEA or the AFT or to change unions to, to an independent union that's not affiliated with the NEA or AFT or any other large labor organization. Uh, Probably the biggest example of disaffiliation is the Clark County Education Association in Nevada. Uh, about 20,000 teachers in the Las Vegas area. I mean, that's that's a large number by any standard. It's about half the teachers in the state, actually. Uh, and they voted back in 2018 to disaffiliate from the NEA. And they reduced the annual dues rate from $800 a year to about $500 a year. 
you know, the Clark County Education Association continues to be the legal exclusive bargaining representative doing everything that it was doing before as a formal labor organization, formal union. Uh, it's just not sending that extra money off to the national headquarters in D.C. Uh, now, there's uh, there's also look a little bit north uh, up in Kansas. There's been a movement in recent years uh, uh, among a number of school districts to uh, form independent unions. Uh, again, that are completely disaffiliated from, not, you know, not affiliated with the uh, National Education Association or AFT, uh, but are legally recognized and certified to act as as the exclusive bargaining agent uh, of teachers in these districts. Uh, the fourth largest district in, in Kansas, the Blue Valley School District, uh, parted ways with the NEA and, and replaced it with an independent, an independent union uh, back in 2019, for example. Uh, now, we have uh, uh, a gentleman uh, who's going to join us here tonight, uh, Justin Grillo, who heads up a, a small independent union out here in Washington State uh, called the Waterville Teachers Leadership Council. Uh, they formed back in 2013 uh, after parting ways with the National Education Association. Again, they're a legally recognized union, bargain and official contract, uh, and they've been very happy uh, with the results and the flexibility and the independence uh, that they have uh, have been able to work with since uh, parting ways with NEA uh, all those years ago. So we're going to hear a little bit more from Justin about the experience of teachers in Waterville uh, with their independent union. We dissolved the union. We formed our own local leadership council. We pay significantly less. We're in control and we're very happy with the outcome. We've got to live what we teach. If we're going to tell kids that they are, they need to be personally responsible for themselves, then we need to show that. We need to model that. That was kind of the catalyst that um, started our journey to becoming an independent organization. Our original idea um, came about because we were asking the question, why? Why are we part of a larger organization? You know, it's for for the contract language and also for uh, legal assistance. We started to just say, can we find a way to do that on our own independently? And we discovered that we could do that. We wanted to make sure that we could maintain professional relationships within our building and really look for the win-win in any situation. We weren't feeling like that was necessarily what we were getting from being a part of the larger organization. Uh, we, we felt that maybe the union wasn't really concerned about relationships as much as it should have been. And so that's the big difference with our council. We want to build trusting relationships between one another and administration and our students. Um, we wanted to be behind something that we could feel proud of. First off, we had to get uh, an initial vote to say that we wanted to attempt to uh, form our own union. In order to show that you have enough interest, pretty simple, you call a meeting, you hand out cards and you, you you do a vote. We showed that we had a majority that wanted to go ahead with uh, decertifying. And once we got the approval from PERC, we really began to work on our contract. Being able to take control of our own contract and go through that process, it's it's a good feeling. It, it, it increased the, the professional relationship that we had amongst ourselves and with administration, and that was the goal. Forming the organization, it took some time, but it wasn't all that difficult. A year later, we are in control of our, our own professional uh, legal advice, our contract, and we're also able to do things for our community that we weren't able to do before. I'm not anti-union. I'm just for people having their own choice. Going back the eight years um, that, so when we started our council, um, it was kind of an interesting time in our in our school. We were reworking our mission statement and things like that. And um, we have a mission statement at our school that says cultivating leaders who thrive with trust, honor, respect, integrity, valor, and involving excellence. And um, as the group of teachers talked about that, we started to discuss um, how could we model that for our students. And um, one of the ways that we thought we could do that is have our own group that took care of the relationship between our 
administration and our teachers. And before we had WEA, and, and there was some conflict there that um, we felt maybe wasn't totally necessary. Just the, the relationship didn't seem like it was the most important thing. And um, so uh, we started to assess that and we started to talk about, so why do we, why are we part of uh, WEA, what do they do for us? And um, like that has been mentioned, one thing that they do is they provide insurance, liability insurance, and that's a big deal. And um, also the other thing that, uh, that WEA would do for us is they'd help with our contract. And so we started to discuss, is there another alternative? Is there another way to do what's being done? And uh, we found uh, NWPE and um, and they've been the organization that has helped us with our liability insurance uh, since that time. And then with our contract, it was kind of interesting because as we started to explore that, uh, we found that we could create our own local only. Um, but one thing that was um, stated to us rather dramatically one day in a uh, meeting was that if we tried to do our own contract, that everything in it would be lost immediately. And um, which is not true at all. Um, a lot of the, when you start to, I'm sure many people know this, but when you start to look at, you know, how contracts are set up, they're backed up by state law. And so um, a lot of things are. And so um, that's, we were, we said, okay, we, we worked with NWPE and then uh, we were connected with a, a lawyer who helped us out. And we went through the process that Max talked about to just certify. Um, so at this point, um, so we've we've set up we've set up our own council. We call it WTLC, Waterville Teacher Leadership Council. It is based on um, building strong relationships with our um, administrators, with each other, and with our students. Um, and the whole mindset behind our group is that we want a win-win relationship constantly. So we're trying to find the win for our students, the win for our district, and the win for us and um, in, in our conversations. And that's uh, very clear to our administration. We're all on the same page with that. Um, and so whenever we sit down to negotiate anything, um, that's the mindset where we're, we talk about this needs to be a win for everybody. How can we make it a win for everybody? And, and that leads to some creative thinking on uh, everyone's part. Um, our dues are all voluntary, um, but it, it's seventeen dollars a month for our dues. Um, that money is within our just within our bank account, uh, and so we have complete control over that uh, all of the money that goes there. Um, we actually haven't had to touch much of it, um, which is which is great. We have we budget it, so we have a certain amount that is, you know, if we need legal counsel. Um, we have another set that is um, for scholarships for our students because we wanted to be sure to keep giving to our students. Uh, we have another part of our budget that is um, for our relationships. So, you know, if um, our secretary retired, uh, so we took money from there to buy her a nice basket with wine and cheese and all those kind of things. And, and we have a um, we have also within that, um, we have a professional dinner that we put on. Uh, everyone's invited. Um, we, the members of our group uh, get to take their spouse and them for free, but anybody else can go for like $15. And we, we encourage everybody to, to show up to that um, because it is about the relationships and we're trying to build those relationships. And we know if our relationships are strong between the teachers and the administration that, that that helps our students, which is the most important part. We also have, we've, we've set up monthly meetings with the, with the administration just to sit down and, and chat about how things are going. Uh, is there any, anything that they, uh, we might need to know about or anything that we could, on, on the teacher side, that maybe we're hearing something that's bothering somebody and maybe there's a way to fix that before it turns into a major problem. Um, because again, we're just about maintaining the relationships. I guess in closing, it's 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 been an awesome opportunity for us. It continues to work. Um, we're in complete control of what happens with us, and uh, it's been a, it's been a good experience. Well, that about brings us to the end of our program tonight, folks. I, I appreciate you again taking time out of your schedules to join with us. 
Hopefully you found the information presented in the webinar to be useful and relevant and edifying. If nothing else, maybe it's got the wheels turning a little bit uh, and, and hopefully you, uh, you're better educated about the full range of options that you uh, have at your disposal when it comes to securing union representation and, uh, and workplace representation uh, that fits for you and, and that makes sense for you and your family and, and uh, your colleagues in your district. Uh, if you have any questions about any of these things, uh, please feel free to reach out to us at Freedom Foundation uh, through uh, optouttoday.com. You can give us a call at 1-833-228-4969. That's 1-833-228-4969. Of course, you can contact us through optouttoday.com. Uh, all of the organizations represented here tonight uh, also have uh, digital presence and uh, people on staff that are, are uh, happy to chat and, and give you more information about anything that, uh, that was covered. Uh, so lots of resources at your disposal. I encourage you to look into it, do your homework, and uh, take advantage of uh, the option that makes sense for you. Thanks again for your time this evening, and take care.